Welcome to Lima Senior High School. I'm Frank Altieri. Enjoy the following event featuring former NFL and OSU player William White and Ohio State University wrestling head coach Tom Ryan. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to Lima Senior High School. Great to have everybody out tonight for this celebration. Uh, my name is Tom Walker from WIMA Radio here in town. I'll be your MC for tonight. Hopefully you won't hear much from me. We're going to hear a lot from these other guys. But before we uh, welcome them out, we do want to uh, pass along some thanks and some acknowledgments. And I would encourage you to remember the folks uh, that are on the inside of your program tonight, uh, including our sponsors. That would include Web Insurance, uh, Union Bank, QP, Financial Solutions Network, and Cage Design. Let's uh, have a round of applause for our sponsors, please. We appreciate all their efforts to help this happen tonight. Also, great job by the DECA students here at Lima Senior as they were uh, promoting this event. I want to recognize them, including Ms. Chrissy, Chrissy Hood is the instructor here at Lima Senior, and students Lauren Zell, Sophie Jolliffe, and Jaden Donald. A round of applause for those kids. They did a lot of work. Appreciate their time to promote this event. Also, big thanks to Lima City Schools for their generosity in hosting the event tonight. Uh, Mr. John Zell and his staff here at Lima Senior, the custodial staff, the graphic arts class here at Senior High, the administration of the high school and the city schools. Also, Pastor Doug Boquist, uh, Steve Stroh with Ohio FCA District 8, uh, Mike Abbey, he's the wrestling coach at Allen East, also Frank Cage of Cage Design. One more round of applause for all those folks and their hard work. And uh, just so you know, this is listed as well, your beneficiaries tonight for all the donations, uh, goodwill donations at the door, include the William White Family Foundation for ALS, that's through Ohio State, also FCA District 8, Team Focus, and Power for Gold, your beneficiaries tonight. So we appreciate your generosity and your time, and we hope that uh, we will touch some lives tonight with our great lineup of speakers. Before we get to that, though, for the invocation, let's welcome Pastor Doug Boquist. You bow your heads with me, gentlemen, if you remove your hats. Our Father in heaven, we have been looking forward to tonight. We thank you for what you are doing in our speakers' lives. We pray that tonight your presence would fill this place. I pray that we would learn some things I pray that our hearts would gather some new things. I pray that you would be pleased with what takes place here tonight. But to put a smile on your face. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Boquist. All right, it's time now to hear from our guests here tonight. First of all, this is all a part of the, some of the work done by C2K, Commitment to Kids. And the president of that organization will join us now. Let's welcome John Bean. Thank you. Uh, I'm here representing the Board of Commitment to Kids. And if we could just for a second, so you know who these people are, I'd ask them to stand so I can introduce them. Where are we all at? So we have, there we go. Uh, the two ladies over here, we have Stephanie Fisher and Colleen Thomas. Uh, Stephanie's from Powell, Ohio, Colleen's from Dublin, uh, Warren Pugsley here in Lima, uh, Chris Jackson, I'm not sure where Chris got to, here in Lima, right here in front of me, front and center, I can't see, I'm getting old. Uh, back here we have Greg Williamson, and we have also uh, Dave Clark, Greg from here in town, you know him as Radar, Dave from Perrysburg, Quincy Simpson back here, who's a big driving force behind everything we do, uh, runs all our basketball program, and we've also got on our board a fellow named Rocky Alt, who's not able to be with us tonight due to some illness. But uh, the Commitment to Kids story is on the back page of your program. I hope you get a chance to read it. I'm not going to go over it with you. But I, again, want to recognize the young people that put this program together tonight. The recipients of this are, by and large, young people. And the people that organize this program tonight are those three young people from Lima Senior. Uh, Ms. Sophie Jolliffe, Ms. Lauren Zell, and Mr. Jaden Donald. So, Thank you for all you've done. Uh, our program tonight is about becoming a character champion in life and for life. Uh, we're all honoring William White here tonight. Those of you here from the Lima area know William's story. Uh, and 
we truly have, we've got three people here tonight that are good, two that are doing introductions. We have three people that are truly character champions. I'm going to, the third character champion that isn't on your program, it's doing an introduction that I want to talk just briefly about, I'll introduce, is Matt Finkus. Matt is the Director of Development at the OSU Wex Wexner Center. Now, some of you are going to remember him as a defensive end. He was a four-year letterman at OSU, three-time All-Big Ten, two-time All-American. All of that gets raves and people know him for that. What I want to share with you about Matt is something that touched me. I read an article earlier this year. I had to get, I had to, um, I had to, had to look at it again to, uh, to understand it, but and to remember that that's who this was. But a while back, he read a tweet on there of a young lady who was fighting cancer, battling cancer. Did not know this young lady, Matt. If those of you that know the Michigan story, and we do say Michigan because this is the home of Xavier Simpson, so we won't call it the team up north. But uh, Matt got. Uh, he, he was a player in a game that beat Michigan. I think it was a 22-6 win in 1994 and got the gold pants. That's what these guys got. It was the one pair of gold pants he had. He doesn't own those anymore. He thought that young lady that he never met deserved those gold pants. So you talk about character champions and people that excel through sport. It's my pleasure to introduce Matt Finkus. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening uh, with these two great speakers, uh, both of whom I know really well. Uh, I'm here to introduce William White. Uh, <laughs> everyone knows William's football accolades, uh, obviously being from Lima. Uh, William is a guy, though, that, that uh, I'm proud to call a friend. Uh, you know, the, I got a call about a year and a half ago from Chris Spielman asking me to come meet at a Tim Hortons and, and talk to William. Uh, about his diagnosis of ALS and, and what he wanted to do around that. And I, obviously, if you know Chris Spielman, you know what he and Stephanie were able to do with their fund and the impact that they've been able to make in the Breast Cancer Society with research and patient care. Uh, and, and in the face of, of this uh, diagnosis that William had, he jumped at the chance to be the face of finding a cure for ALS. And uh, that, that, that's no small responsibility, but if you know William, you know he's a guy who, who jumped at it without thinking twice. And so uh, it, it's an honor for me to call William a friend. Uh, we didn't play together, but uh, I remember his son Brendan from when you came back and, and I was still playing at Ohio State. He'd bring his son around the, the, the workouts every once in a while. So I've known him for a long, long time. And uh, I'm very proud to call William a friend. And, and any of you that want to make an impact today and help William in his fund, you can go to give2osu.edu and search the William White Family Fund and, and help him out in his uh, awareness and fundraising campaign. So as all of you know, I'm, I'm happy to introduce uh, Lima's favorite son, Thank William you. White. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate I Thank you all for coming out today. And uh, one of the things, again, all y'all that 30 and older, don't listen to me, because I'm not focusing on y'all right now. It's about the youth, our future. And I can remember growing up on Reese Street, across from Whittier, again, y'all kids may not know Whittier because it's not there. And see, you remember it, don't you? You remember them days. And the thing that I, I've learned in life is don't let your environment or your situations around you affect who you are. You are your own person. As I always told my kids, I do not believe in bullying because people can say whatever they want to say about you. That does not mean one thing. You got to have faith and belief in yourself. When I, went, when I decided I wanted to be an engineer, I went to my dad, worked at uh, General Motors. In a foundry, I think it was in the eighth or ninth grade, I went up there, had a little tour, and if you've ever been to a foundry in June, it is really, really hot. And there was one guy in there that had an air condition office, and I said, if I gotta work here, I'm doing that. That's what I'm gonna do. And he was an engineer. I had no idea what an engineer was. But he told me something that actually has remained with me and I, and I love spreading it around. He said, your brain is just like a, it's a muscle. Just practice. Practice your math, practice your social studies, practice your English. 
And that's what I did. I was all, I was, I think I had all D's and the F at the time when I decided I wanted to be an engineer. And, you know, probably a whole lot of people don't think you can do engineering with all D's and the F, right? But I start practicing math and science like I practice football and basketball. The more you practice, the better you'll become. The more you worry less about what someone says about you, what they call you, because everybody thinks like playing in the NFL is like the coolest thing in the world. You gotta understand when you're in a locker room or in a, in a in meeting room or a locker room with eight other guys, you're watching film, and four of you guys are starting, six of you guys are not starting, those six guys wanna do what? Start. So do you think they really your friends? They trying to do everything they can to get ahead of you. But you can't let what they say about you call you names. I mean, I don't know how many names I've been called when I was in college and especially in the NFL. But I don't care. You can call me whatever you want to call me. Once you have faith and you know who you are and what you want to do, that's the only thing that matters. When I went to Ohio State, uh, Sean Bell was my roommate. And I, I never forget, uh, I put on, my, on our mirror in there, I had a, a statement that said, is what you're getting ready to do going to help you get your engineering degree? And I used to walk around also with it in my pocket. And I was offered a whole bunch of times to go to High Street and kick it with them. And every time they would ask me to do something like that, I just go in my pocket and ask myself a question. Is this going to get me to where I want to be? Your life is up to you. What do you want to do? Lady right there, she was asking me, you know, didn't you ask me that question? Mm-hmm. Remember that question you asked me? What was it? I just want to see I want to call you out. I like calling people out. Are you talking about the second question I asked you? No, it could have been the third. <laughs> Uh-uh, no, no, uh-uh, no, that wasn't the one. <laughs> she talked about how do you want, you want people to follow your footsteps. Do y'all understand? These are my footsteps. When you walk, those are your footsteps. What footsteps you want to follow? How committed are you to doing what exactly what it is you want to do? It's up to you. Don't worry about what people say what they do, you be committed. When you wake up in the morning, I always tell people, kids, when you wake up in the morning, you brushing your teeth. Y'all do brush your teeth every morning, right? <laughs> okay, I didn't see you shake your head, man. I'm looking at you. You didn't really shake your head. You, should, you brush your teeth every morning? Okay, there we go. When you brush your teeth every morning, can you truly look in that mirror and say, I love you? I love you, and not laugh, be very serious, because there's a word in scripture that says, you know, you love your neighbor as yourself. The key is love yourself, because you don't love yourself, please don't try to love on me. If you love Michigan like that lady up there got that uh, amazing blue sweater on, <sighs> mm, mm, mm. That, must, that must be, uh, we're, we're Dr. Hood. See, see what you see, Dr. Hood, stand up. She's a teacher here. She likes that. Team up. Okay, never mind. Okay, anyway, back to you. It's seriously, you can do whatever you want to do. It's up to you. And if you play, and if you play in sports, as I was on the radio yesterday, there's a reason why they call it student athlete. Your real career is the student. There's 10,000 people, what, no, I think there's 15,000 people or something like that playing uh, college football. 200 get drafted every year. Half of them make it. The average time in the NFL is three and a half years, I believe it is. 3.2 years. You're 24 years old and you're done. What are you going to do the rest of your life? There's nothing wrong with having that aspiration, but your true career is the student. So all you that right now in, in, in school, focus on that. Practice your math. So I always tell you, if you spend two to three hours every day studying, 
that's not going to kill anything. Your social media is not going anywhere. It will help you be not only a better person, but get to you where you want to get to. And don't worry about what other folks say. Let them say whatever they want to say about you. Have confidence in yourself. Believe in yourself. And you can truly achieve whatever it is you want to, to achieve. Now the next person I'm going to bring up is really awesome. Y'all think I got a resume. I mean, he's been at Ohio State 13 years. Two-time, two-time all national coach of the year. Two times, national coach of the year. Four-time Big Ten. And I don't think Urban got any of that, right? I don't think. He... That's why we didn't invite Urban to come. We invited the one and only. Right, just as many national titles. This is the man, the myth, the legend, Coach Tom Ryan. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me all right? Fine, I'm not going to. So, is, is, will that work? I've got a. Can you hear me up top? You guys hear me? So, yeah, ironically, Coach Meyer is now in the athletic department. Do you know that? So, he's now. Uh, to some degree, he's, he, uh, oversees the, he'll oversee the wrestling program a little bit. So after the Rose Bowl, I called him. And I said, Coach, uh, obviously congratulations, and I'm looking forward to you helping me win more national titles than you did. And his response was, oh, I'll help you win three, but no more. Because <laughs> Coach Meyer won three. He said, I'm, off, I'm too competitive for that. So thanks to everyone involved in making tonight's event such a success. Uh, Tonight, I know, was the vision of John and his team um, who worked tirelessly to make this happen. We met in an event because we were both looking up. I met William because we both look up, and Matt Finkus, we look up. We've got two feet on, on earth, but we look up, and that's why our paths have crossed. So again, I know uh, a lot of people here made this happen besides John's team. If you were involved in any way, I know there's some students that did some marketing, could you just please stand? If you helped in any way tonight, please stand. You three, I met you three, and stand, yeah, please. Thank you so much, yeah. So thank you. So God bless William White, the hometown hero. Ironically, he introduced me, right? I should be introducing him. Uh, he knows this community well, and tonight, at an event before this one, I met a lot of his friends. A lot of people he grew up with since he was a young boy. And they told me how they had pizza with him, played on teams with him. And he just stood out, besides being a great athlete, he stood out as a, as a great person, a great friend, a great man. They love him. And I'm not surprised, as I've gotten to know William through some events, but I learned a lot about William as well because his son, his son went to school with my daughter. And it's true that our children are often a reflection of their parents, of the examples they have around them, because we all know, right, that example is our greatest teacher. And William is that. My daughter said this, and he's the nicest kid in the school. Isn't it interesting, besides being the best athlete in the school, he was the nicest kid in the school. He built people up. He was an example. So no surprise that William is the man he is and his son is following in his footsteps. So an honor to uh, be with you tonight and share a little bit about you and, and your son from, from my lens. So I've been coaching wrestling for nearly 30 years at Ohio State for 13. Some of the hardest working, any wrestlers here or people that have wrestled, right? So some of the hardest working people on planet Earth uh, have chosen the sport of wrestling. And they're able to suffer at a hard level. So I want to say that again for all of you young people. They're able to suffer at a very high level because I've learned in my life that suffering is where the magic is. When parents ask me, hey, does my son have what it takes to wrestle for Ohio State, what do you think I answer with? A simple question. How much are they willing to suffer because we know that suffering and sacrifice and love 
are just synonyms. They mean the same thing. They sound different, but they mean the same thing. These men that I coach come from across the country, many from Ohio, but around this great country. And you know what I've learned? Despite the fact that they're great examples in their schools, and they, and they had great examples, and they're among the elite of the population in general, in workload, in work capacity, and focus, and discipline, and drive, here's what I know. I know they need help. They're 18 to 22. 18 when they come in, 22 when they walk out. They need help. They need help. They need, they need tough love. They need tender love. Interesting, a wrestling coach talking about being tough and tender. Isn't that true for all you parents? How critical toughness is, but tender as well. And they need truth like each one of us. Like most of us, we think we've got it, but we don't. We think we've got it all figured out, but the truth is we don't have it all figured out. You don't, and I don't. So the question then is, who does, and how do we get it? Where do we find it? So I've learned that, I'm gonna ask you three questions. So some of you may have cell phones. If you don't have a cell phone, piece of paper, pen, I'm going to ask you to write an answer to three questions. I've learned that when someone's speaking at you, sometimes uh, it's more of an inspirational, motivational speech, and that doesn't go as well as we get interactive. So we're going to get a little interactive. I've got a two-hour drive home, and I'm not worried about it. I know how much time I have here. But I came here to make a difference, to impact you in some way. So here are the, first, here are the three questions, and you can use your phone to write your answer. And you'll need your answer because you're going to partner up with somebody here in a second. And you're going you're to communicate with each other. All right? So this is what we do at Ohio State Wrestling. This is the first thing that we do. We teach them how to communicate with each other, how to look in each other's eyes, how to put their phone down, how to listen, how to be curious. Because the best in the world at anything they do are curious. And they're great listeners and great question askers. So here we go, the first question, I'll give you a few minutes to answer these questions, and then we're gonna pair you up with somebody. All right, so here we go. First question, if you had 20 minutes, like I do tonight, if you had 20 minutes to share with a group of people you cared about, what message would you share? That's the first question. You had 20 minutes, the world's gonna end in 20, you're only going to, you may interact with these people one time. You've got 20 minutes. What message would you share? Second, I know you probably didn't answer it that quickly, but the second one. I'm going to give you time to write. So the second question. Why are you here tonight? And what were you hoping to get out of tonight? Why did you come? Why did you choose to leave the comfort of your house or wherever you were and come here tonight? And what were you hoping to get out of it? And then the third question, well, is everyone, want me to repeat that? Yeah. So the second question is, why are you here? Why'd you come? Why'd you come to Lima High School tonight? And what were you hoping to learn tonight? And then the third question is this one. And this one changes in our life at different times, but ultimately, uh, we'll come to a place, hopefully, where our priceless all meet. And the question is, what is your priceless? What is your priceless? So Webster's definition of priceless is so precious that its value cannot be determined. Priceless. What is your priceless? And the Webster's definition is so precious that its value cannot be determined. So I'm gonna give you a minute or two. Does anybody need me to repeat any of the three questions before they answer them? Number three, what is your priceless? Now, one would say that if I taped your mouth closed, you young people, if I tape your mouth closed for a while, which is really tough to do when you're young, it's tough for men to do at any age, but it's really tough for young people to do. 
because we like to talk. But if I taped your mouth closed and followed you around for a few weeks, I'd likely learn you're priceless. But I'm asking you now because maybe you haven't thought about what your priceless is. But what is your priceless? So that's the question. <laughs> a few minutes. So as you're writing, I'll speak a little further. So in our team, when these guys come together, here's the thing, in this age, in this era, I've learned that people are not very good at communicating with each other. We spend a lot of time on our phones. Coach, uh, William talked about the, the value we place in social media. But it's amazing how a lack of com communication can cause conflict between coaches and athletes, between parents and children, between leaders, between friends, the inability to just communicate. And it's something that we often do with our wrestling team because we put value in it. So what we'll do now is we're going to partner up. So you can grab someone to your right or to the left. And here are the rules of communication. One person will ask the three questions. One person will ask the other the three questions. And they'll just listen to what they have to say. I'm going to give you three minutes. You'll ask the question. The other person will answer. And then we'll switch. We'll do it the other way. And the rules are simple. You make eye contact. You're curious. You're listening. And you're not thinking about what you want to say. You're thinking about what they're saying. This works really well in marriage, in friendships, and is a good healer for most of the problems that we have just communicating. So grab somebody. I'll start the clock. You got four minutes each. Ask the questions and learn something about the person you're next to. Get a partner. So the bottom line is we're all fundamentally the same. Right? I believe that we're the same because we have the same builder. Created to love and for love. The power source uh, that you tap into is so critical. And you've got, you've got two options the way I see it. And you young people, you young people, do you, you, do you know that the state of Ohio right now leads the nation in opioid deaths? More young people, middle age, are dying in the state of Ohio over opioid addiction than any other state in this country. So we have it all figured out, we don't. We're chasing things that are fool's gold. As the wrestling coach at Ohio State, you know, I'm really fortunate because I get to meet a lot of amazing people. I get to hear a lot of stories. And besides the families that have lost loved ones to opioid addiction, the other story I hear a lot, to me is one of the most cowardly things that one human being can do to another. The most cowardly things, one of them. And that's cyberbullying. I know families whose children have ended their lives because a group of kids got together and hid in the silence of their room and made up fake stories and talked about someone else's child. So raise your hand here if you're a parent. All right, you, you children, young adults, look around the room. There's a lot of parents. Here's what I know about a parent. I know this. I know that for me, for me, I've spent a lifetime loving my kids. I've got a 26-year-old. And I've got a 22-year-old, and I have an 18-year-old, and I work tirelessly to put them in environments around the best people they could be around. There's nothing I wouldn't do for them. If someone came in here right now and my children were here and they were threatening, I would gladly get in the way. But to have a scenario 
where one human being feels the right to diminish the worth of another makes no sense. It's cowardly. And as a leader in the school, if you came here, wherever school you're from, whatever region, whoever you influence, you got to make a difference. you got to stand up. And here's what I know. I know that we're more, you may have more friends on Instagram and Twitter and Snapchat, but people are more low than ever. Than ever. We value what people say online more than, the, than we should. Cyberbullying. Instagram likes. We create value out of that. I know four things that you'll need to climb really high. And these men, a lot of, a lot of men here and women have them. Four things you need. You need a tireless work ethic. You need talent. That'll get you to the top, but will keep you there. It will sustain that as character. Your ability to control your impulses. And the last thing you'll need are people, the right people. So for me, question three, the priceless question, changed when I was 36. I was 36 years old when my priceless changed. So I'm about some of you when you think about what your priceless is. So precious as value cannot be determined. That might be your Xbox right now or, or Fortnite. I don't know what it is for you, but I know for me it was wrestling. Wrestling was my priceless. I couldn't put a, a price tag on how good I wanted to be and how much I wanted to succeed at it. So precious as value cannot be determined. And then at 36 years old, I encountered what I call unchosen suffering. See, there's two types of suffering. Chosen, which is the type of suffering I like to impose on my team. I want them to impose that on themselves. I want them to work tirelessly, put themselves in challenging situations in the, on the mat. It's the guy that runs the extra mile, although he's tired at mile two, he runs five. Chosen suffering makes sense to all of us. Hey, the harder I work, the luckier I get. It made sense to me. It was a foundational piece of my life. When I was 36, I'd be confronted with unchosen suffering. Has anybody here experienced unchosen suffering? Raise your hand. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I was born, I was really blessed. I was born in the home of the great mom and dad. I don't know that all of us have had that. But I know that unchosen suffering changed me. It changed my priceless. My priceless went from wrestling. It was February 16th, 2004. I was the head coach of a team out in New York. Life was great. Had a house, two cars, four kids, 11, 9, 6, and 3. And life was going amazing for me. You know, all the, all the chosen suffering had paid off. You know, all the surrounding yourself with the right people paid off. And on February 16, 2004, that would change for me. Great night. If you look back on your calendar, that was President's Day. The best thing about President's Day? No class. So I gave my wife a break, and the kids came to, to practice with me that day. They spent the entire day in the restroom room with me. We laughed, we played, we had a great time. We drove home that night, and I remember thinking, man, am I blessed. So all you parents know that the best times of life are the times you spend with your children. For those of you that are children, you don't get that yet. But in time, you will. It was a great day. We got home around 6 o'clock, had a family dinner. We talked about the fun we had. We played dodgeball, running bases. We wrestled, we laughed, we ate. We just enjoyed each other. After dinner, someone's got to shower first, so we voted Teague. He was five, six. He was six. He was six, and he was chosen to shower first, and he got up from the table and started running around the room. And my wife started chasing him. We take a lot of things for granted. I didn't need a lesson on parenthood or on how to love a child, but I was going to get a lesson I was not ready for. 
So as he ran around the house, my wife chased him and she picked him up. She scooped him up. Now I have no reason to tell you anything other than the truth. And the truth is when she picked him up, something overwhelmed me. I felt something just, I don't know what it was, but I do now. And she carried him to the back of the house and she started screaming that he wasn't breathing. He was healthy. He could do 10 pull-ups. He was six. He could wrestle all day. He was in the corner of every match we had. So I ran in the back of the house and I grabbed him and I put him on the coffee table. And I pumped on his chest and I breathed in his mouth. My wife called 911. And for 14 minutes we waited for the ambulance to arrive. At about 14 minutes, the ambulance pulls into the driveway. I see the lights. And they were walking up to our house. And I remember them when they walked into my house, how I screamed at them. I was so fearful. I was, I was scared. And I said, where were you? Where were you? It's been 14 minutes. It took you so long. You were two miles away. And they grabbed him. They did some tests on him. Code blue, code blue. And they picked him up, and now they ran him into the ambulance. My wife and I jumped in the car, and we followed. And the neighbor watched our three other children at the house. Jordan, 11, Jake, 9, Mackenzie, 3. And we followed the ambulance all the way to the hospital. And two things occurred on the way there. The first thing that occurred so I called my older brother and I said, Frank, we had seven in our family. I said, Frank, something happened to Teague. He just fell over. He's not breathing. Here's the hospital we're going to. Let mom and dad know. And the second thing that happened, what do you think? My wife and I began to pray together. We've been married 12 years. We never prayed together. We were busy living. We were just busy living, raising a family, paying the bills, trying to build a championship team, we were just busy living, but we started to pray. We got to that hospital, and an hour and a half went by, and we were in the waiting room. And the unthinkable was going to happen. And after an hour and a half, the surgeon comes out, and the family had gathered. A bunch of us were, my wife and I are holding hands, and I see the doctor, the surgeon, coming toward me, and he won't look up. And he said this. He said, Mr. and Mrs. Ryan, we're just, we're sorry. We're so sorry. Listen, five-year-olds don't just fall over. I was lost. I was completely lost. Imagine the drive home. My wife and I have to drive home the few miles. And as we pull in the driveway, all of you parents remember when your children are little and you come home from work, where are they? At the doorway. When they're older... They're out the back door. <laughs> but when they're younger, they're at the front door. I pull into the driveway, and I couldn't even get out of my car. Jake was a small nine. Teague was a big six. They were wrestling partners. They were best friends. They were going to spend their life together. So I opened the car door. And Jake asked me a question. You know, I said it earlier, for you young people, all of the best at what they do are great question askers. They're curious. They want knowledge. Like I've heard a couple times, they want to get better. They want to improve. You never arrive. You're always on this journey to being the best version of you. So this nine-year-old, as I open the door, what does he ask me? Yeah. Where is Teague? I was 36 years old. I couldn't answer the question. I did not know all the hard work, all the leading people, that, that, that nice house and the two cars, and I couldn't answer the most fundamental question that every human being must know. Why are we here? How did we get here? It's a simple question. Why had I not thought about it? I had researched nutrition and strength training and technique. I could have told that nine-year-old the name of every single recruit in the country that I wanted, where they were from, their success, 
what weight they wrestled. I could tell that kid everything about my team, but I couldn't tell him where Teague was. You know why? Because it was never my price list. It was never the single most important thing in my life because my life was filled with the busyness of the world, the busyness of it. But now my price list was a simple, finding an answer to a simple question. The definition, Webster's definition of priceless, so precious, its value cannot be determined. There was no price tag on it. I couldn't put a price tag on it. I spent day and night researching and reading and learning. And I came up with this. I came up and I've done a lot of the research and if you haven't, what I did, I researched those that had researched their whole life. What did they think? Harvard Law School, Yale Law School, professors, doctors, janitors, people with experiences that were unexplainable. What did they believe? And I came up with the two options, and there's only two. There's only two options, and I dove into both. If you young people, I know you think you got it all figured out like I did. But you don't. Until you quiet the madness of the world and you pay attention to this simple question, this priceless in my life became, where is he? Option one, so don't miss this. Option one is you are here by chance. A lot of people spend their lives believing that. And let me go further. There are only two, as I said, there's only two. And one is true and one is false. They are not both true. What was your name? Gavin, Gavin gave some great answers when he, was my, he came up. If Gavin and I wrestled right now for 30 minutes right here on this floor, and I left, I left, I called my wife and I said, met some amazing people. They were all here for knowledge and to get better and just spend some time and see William White and Finkus and this, this, this vision that John had for this region, but I wrestled this dude and I beat him 100 nothing. <laughs> and he leaves and he calls his mom and goes, Mom, I got to wrestle Coach Ryan. He shared this story with us, but, and I got to wrestle him and I beat him 100 nothing. <laughs> What's happening? This dude's lying. Right? Someone's lying. Someone's lying. So we have two options. Option one is that we're all here by chance. We're on this rock flying through space that something exploded and over time it went from a one-celled organism to what we see here today. That's option one. Chance. Option two and option one are polar opposites. They cannot coexist unless God caused that. But option two is that we're made in the image of a loving God who created us in his image and wants the best for us and has a plan for us and wants to know us. If he made you, wouldn't he want to know you? Wouldn't you want to know who made you and what, what he has in store for you and what his standard is? So I went through this journey, and I don't believe because I was forced to. Isn't that beautiful? He let me live like that for 36 years. I believe because at the end of the day, what I did is I had a piece of paper, and I split down the middle, God, no God, and I studied both. And I put every reason why I believe Jesus Christ is who he said he was. And I put every reason that was interesting, and I learned about evolution. And at the end of the day, my right side about God was far longer than the left. And I got on my knees and I said, I had to make a decision, yes? We can't just leave it. In the most important decisions of your life, you have to choose. But so many consider and then just leave. You're buying a new car for the family. You look at all the cars. You have to have a car to get from one place to another. You see some things you like about car A and car B, but ultimately you must choose. So my challenge for you tonight 
is to quiet the madness of your life. However good it's going or not. And dig into the simple and most important question you'll ever answer. Is he or is he not? not? You know, come like some of my guys ask me, what if I, what if I look? And if I search, and I find a different answer, that won't happen. It won't happen. It can't happen. Because if you open your heart and truly look and search, I believe that you'll find that answer. And know that you're staring at a person that knew, I know that God could have saved that kid. He could have. There's no question he could have, but he didn't. And I still love him because I got to know him. And I know the impact he's had in my life and the people that he surrounded me with. So I challenge you, more than anything tonight, I challenge you to just search. And don't believe because Coach Ryan believes or the pastor believes or mommy believes, or daddy believes, or William Bright, or Matt Finkus, or your neighbor. Believe in a way that when it's challenged, you can stand firm in it. Because you know, because you found enough to believe. So God bless you guys, and thanks for having me.